All right, welcome to the fourth of four lectures for lecture number eight. This lecture is going to focus on gene expression in bacteria. And the question that we want to ask ourselves of, of the, oh, and I meant to look this up. Let me look it up really quick. Why not? Let me get out of here. How do I do this? Get out of PowerPoint and let's go into Google, Le Goog, and let's see what we got here. Do, 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 do. How many genes are in E. coli, for example? 3,000 genes. <laughs> I have a feeling that's an estimate. <laughs> that's way too neat of a number um, to be uh, <laughs> accurate. But let's just say, for example, that there's a few thousand genes in E. coli. Are all the, the question is, and the question that you need to ask yourself is, are these genes all getting transcribed and translated or basically expressed? Are these genes being expressed at the same time um, and essentially all the time? And of course the answer is no, there's really no reason for this to happen. And it's a huge waste of time and energy. Remember that bacteria are the ultimate warriors, right? They're always competing for energy, for growth, for nutrients. And if they're wasting their time making genes that they don't need, they're going to get taken over by other bacteria. And so it's a constant um, it's a constant battle for these bacteria to have very elaborate sensor systems that allow them to respond to their environment at any given time and only express the genes that they want on at that particular time. So when we talk about genes and gene expression and gene products, what we're really talking about are proteins. Remember that um, for most people, when we say, when we refer to a gene product, we're referring to a protein and it's almost always an enzyme, the main um, value of most proteins is their enzymatic uh, function, particularly particularly for our class. Um, but remember that gene products don't necessarily have to be proteins. Can you think of a couple of examples of gene products that aren't a protein? Well, you should be able to come up with three pretty quickly because we just talked about them. Messenger RNA, transfer RNA, and ribosomal RNA. Uh, you could also think about um, the fact that DNA also uh, one product of DNA is more DNA. DNA serves as a template for producing more DNA, right? It's a template for its own replication. So gene products um, can be other things, but typically when we talk about the expression of a gene in a gene product, we're talking about proteins. <clears throat> so when we talk about gene products, and um, again, let's just let's just for simplicity's sake, um, not only agree that we're discussing we're referring to proteins, but we're referring to enzymes in particular. So we're narrowing this down to proteins in particular um, enzymes. And let's talk about when we might need enzymes and when we don't. Now there are some enzymes that we're always, I always say we, bacteria, bacteria are always going to need. For example, all of those enzymes that are in the central metabolic pathways, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and so on, we're, bacteria are always using those enzymes. They're, the glycolysis is always occurring because bacteria are processing carbohydrates in what, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, in one way or another. So those genes are pretty much always on. Um, however, most enzymes, most gene products aren't always on. They need to either be turned, they need to be, how should I say this? The enzymes need to be able to be controllable. And there's a couple of ways that we can control the activity of an enzyme. One way of controlling an enzyme is through direct control. In other words, we can turn this enzyme off and on either through allosteric inhibition and activation by binding a repressor and changing the shape of that enzyme, or we could control it through the presence or absence of cofactors and coenzymes. Remember that a lot of enzymes need uh, cofactor, either a cofactor or a coenzyme in order to work. And if it doesn't have that, we can control the activity of that enzyme by either um, by regulating the expression of that cofactor or coenzyme. A better way for bacteria really, I shouldn't say better, but um, hmm, 
a more energy efficient way for bacteria to control the expression or control the activity of an enzyme is to control it at the genetic level. In other words, why why go through the hassle of transcribing and translating a protein when as soon as that protein is in uh, is made, we just turn it off, right? We just wasted all this time and energy making a protein when that protein is just going to sit there and get turned uh, turned off because we don't really need it. So the question a bacteria has to ask itself, if it if it was able to ask itself a question, is why why even make it? Why can I just turn the expression of that gene off and keep that gene off until I need it? And that's exactly what bacteria do. Genes are only transcribed, um, ideally, I should say, genes are only transcribed when there is actual need for the enzyme itself. So there's a couple of approaches to thinking about genetic control. We could have a genetic control system that's inducible. In other words, it's typically off and we're going to turn it on when we need it. And these are typical of catabolic pathways. So if we're not if a bacteria is not used to catabolizing a certain type of carbohydrate or a certain um, nutrient source, that gene, the, 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 the gene that codes for those enzymes that break down that particular nutrient are going to typically be turned off, but the bacteria can turn them on. In other words, the bacteria can induce their expression uh, when those nutrients are present. On the other hand, bacteria have systems that are repressible. In other words, they're usually on, but they're capable of being turned off. Now, these pathways are very typical of anabolic pathways. For example, most bacteria have to make all their own amino acids. Uh, if, if you think about all the, the 20 so odd um, amino acids that make up all of our proteins, amino acids aren't just simply laying around for bacteria to grab onto and use. So bacteria, um, uh, E. coli is a perfect example, E. coli has to anabolize all of those amino acids so that it can make protein. So those, those pathways are typically turned on. But let's say that E. coli hits the jackpot and for whatever reason this bacteria lands in a soup, uh, let's say it gets into some nice BHI broth, some brain heart infusion broth, where there's lots and lots of amino acids and it's a smorgasbord of all the different amino acids that it could possibly want. Well, now it's a waste of time uh, and energy, again, a waste of time and energy for E. coli to express all of these proteins because they don't need them anymore. So it would be nice in these instances that E. coli could repress those genes that um, are typical for those, um, for construction of those amino acids. So another way of looking at it is that inducible enzymes have to get turned on. They're not usually on, but they must get turned on in order to function. Whereas repressible, repressible enzymes are typically on, but in some rare instances, we might want to turn them on, turn them off because we don't necessarily need them at that time. So a way that I kind of, um, an analogy that I like to um give here is think about your household. Um, you have an electric bill every month and you make decisions about how to use your energy. And if you have everything, think about all of the things that use electricity in your house. If you had all of them on all the time, you would have a huge electric bill and you don't really need that, right? You have, and nobody needs that, especially right now. We don't need a big electric bill. So we make decisions about things that we typically leave off and we're going to turn them on only when we need them. So a toaster, a toaster oven, um, a microwave, a um, our television, right? Most of these things are hair dryer. Um, uh, most of these things you can imagine are typically off and we're going to turn them on only when we need them. So they're, in other words, they're inducible. They're ready to get turned on. Now there are a few items in our house that are typically on and we pretty much always leave them on, but for whatever rare instance, for whatever reason, we might want to turn them off. So my, my favorite one, a student gave an example a couple semesters ago, are smoke alarms. Think about our smoke alarms are typically on and we want to leave them on um, except if you're cooking. <laughs> so apparently I guess that student wasn't a very good cook and they had to turn their smoke alarm off while they were cooking um, uh, um, for the obvious reason. So um, another example might be your refrigerator. You want to always keep that on because of course you have food in there 
but you might be doing some spring cleaning or um, for whatever reason you want to turn your fridge off, let it defrost and clean the entire fridge out. And then of course you're going to turn it back on again. So there's a few examples of some electrical things in your home where you have them always on, but for, for whatever reason you might want to turn them on. So we have inducible versus repressible. So the question is, let's go back to our bacteria model. How do we actually control this? Remember that bacteria aren't, they're not us, right? They can't walk around and plug things in and, and um, uh, switch off or switch on um, uh, a switch in order to control the electricity. Bacteria have to have very sensitive kind of response systems in order to control the expression of these genes. And the system that they use is a, we, we call it an operon. And an operon is the way that the gene itself is organized. So here we see an example of an operon. This looks like um, it doesn't necessarily, I guess it's kind of a generic operon, but this is very similar to what um, the LAC operon looks like. Um, but we can see that an operon contains two basic regions, a control region, and then the actual genes themselves. So this particular operon encodes for three different genes, and in this case they happen to be structural genes, not enzymatic genes, doesn't really matter. We have gene X, gene Y, and gene Z. So in order for these genes, for their expression to be controlled, we need a way to control control the way that, um, I shouldn't say the way, the ability of RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter and go down this strand of DNA and express these uh, X, Y, and G genes into a messenger RNA transcript. So in the control region, we have the promoter. Remember the promoter is where RNA polymerase uh, can bind. It recognizes this promoter region. And once it binds to that promoter region, it's going to start moving downstream until, and it will start transcribing, right, the, the mRNA. And at some point, that messenger RNA will show an AUG start codon for X, an AUG start codon for Y, and an AUG start codon for Z. However, in between the promoter region and the structural genes, or the, the, the actual genes that are going to be expressed in this particular operon, is a region of DNA called the operator. And the operator is a region where a protein called a repressor protein can bind. And so if you think about this whole um, stretch of DNA here as a, um, as like railroad tracks, and our RNA polymerase is kind of our train moving down the tracks, the operator is a place where we can put a big, like um, almost like a big clamp on, on the, I'm, I'm moving my hands again. I realize you guys can't see me. Um, the operator region is an area where we can put a big clamp on the railroad itself so that the train can't move past it. And in this way, we can suppress the expression of all of these genes, right? If the polymerase, if RNA polymerase can't move past, it's getting physically blocked by an operator, um, um, I'm sorry, by a repressor bound to the operator, then RNA polymerase isn't ever going to get to the stretch of DNA that actually codes for anything. So we have, uh, just to again, quickly review, we have an operon that contains uh, a regulatory region and the genes themselves. And um, some, uh, I don't really consider this part of the operon, some people do, but remember at some point we're going to have, somewhere in our genome, we're going to have a gene that codes for the repressor protein itself. So this gene is going to um, code for a repressor protein, and that repressor protein is going to bind to the operator and not allow RNA polymerase to move past that operator region because it's being physically blocked by that repressor protein. So again, we have two states. Inducible um, uh, systems are typically off and must be turned on while repressible systems are typically on, whoops, sorry, typically on and must be turned off. <clears throat> so let's look at how that looks. In an inducible system, in other words, in an induction model here, uh, transcription is usually off. Remember that inducible means that they're usually off. So we can see here that we have a, a repressor protein that is bound to the operator and it's blocking the ability of RNA polymerase to move down the strand of DNA and get to the genes themselves. 
However, in a repressible model, the repressor protein is not able to bind, again, this is a separate, separate protein, um, some other protein uh, that's a repressor for this particular operon is unable to bind to the operator in this case. And RNA polymerase has the clear kind of go ahead to move on down the DNA uh, railroad and um, express these genes. So again, inducible systems normally off, operator is blocked. Repressor systems or repressor repression Mm, repression systems, repression operons, typically off because the operator is clear and RNA polymerase is able to um, move forward. So let's look at what happens in induction. In an induction model, we're going to have some molecule that serves as an inducer. In other words, it's like a, it's like a molecular signal for this bacteria to start expression of whatever these genes are. So when this inducer binds to the repressor, it's not going to allow that, that repressor now changes, changes shape. In other words, it's allosteric, what would this be? Allosteric repression, right? We're allosterically inhibiting the function of this protein. And this protein is no longer able to bind to the operator, and now transcription can take place. So again, something that's normally off, something that's normally blocked from transcription is now clear and that operator is no longer bound to repressor and we can get induction of these particular genes. Now let's look at what happens in a repressible system. Remember, repressible system typically on, uh, this RNA polymerase can go ahead and transcribe these genes. But what can happen here now, instead of having a molecule that induces, we're going to have a molecule that represses um, expression. So this molecule now is going to bind to the repressor protein, and we're going to call this molecule a co-repressor because it's going to allow this repressor uh, protein to actually work. So in other words, this little molecule, this green or um, uh, blue little uh, molecule is going to bind to this protein and allosterically activate this protein. Notice how it slightly changed the shape of this protein. This protein is now able to bind to the operator region. And once it's bound to the operator region, the RNA polymerase is physically blocked from moving down the, um, uh, the stretch of DNA and getting to the genes for transcription. So we have a very simple model here where we have two different systems of uh, control, inducible systems and repressible systems. Pretty cool. Let's look at an example of a repressible system. And again, remember that repressible systems are typical of anabolic pathways. So all of the things, imagine all of just the proteins alone, all of the proteins that, um, I shouldn't say proteins, the amino acids alone that a cell, a bacteria has to make for itself. Again, let's picture... Let's picture E. coli in glucose salts broth. Remember, glucose salts broth is a very, very basic broth. All it really has in it is some glucose, and I think it was ammonium, some um, NH4, and water, and maybe a little bit of salt, and that's it. So it literally has zero amino acids in the broth available for E. coli to grow. In other words, if E. coli wants to make proteins and therefore survive, it has to build all of those amino acids from scratch. So all of these anabolic pathways are going to be on, and that's fairly common in nature. If you look at bacteria that are um, surviving in nature, they have to build lots and lots of stuff from scratch. They're the ultimate um, kind of adaptable organisms because they never know, um, if you think about it, the more enzymes that it has and the more things it's able to build, the more extreme circumstances it's able to survive in, which is a huge survival advantage for bacteria. <clears throat> so the trip op the trip operon codes for the synthesis of an amino acid called tryptophan. Remember, it's one of the roughly 20 amino acids that we use to make up proteins. <clears throat> And we don't necessarily, so t again, typically tryptophan isn't just hanging around for the bacteria to pick up. But however, imagine that E. coli found itself in a broth that supplied lots of tryptophan. So all of a sudden we take E. coli and we move it from a glucose salts broth to 
um, brain heart infusion where we have lots and lots of amino acids for this bacteria to use. If that's the case, then the enzymes that are used to produce tryptophan, we don't really need those. We don't need those enzymes to be expressed, so we should be able to turn that off. Again, tryptophan, that tryptophan typically on, but we need to be able to, or the bacteria need to be able to repress that system should the, that bacteria get lucky enough to be in a situation where there's lots and lots of tryptophan. So this is the thing that I think is really cool. <laughs> and and um, I think the, the fact that tryptophan is the co-repressor shows you how smart evolution and natural selection is. So think about this. The amino acid itself is the molecule that controls the expression of this operon. And it, it makes total sense if you think about it. Let's let's actually go to the, the pictures of the models. So remember, we want, typically we have low tryptophan levels. We're here. And if tryptophan levels are high, so tryptophan is this little yellow molecule here, some of that tryptophan will bind to the repressor protein and block the expression of the genes needed to make tryptophan. It's a super elegant system because the molecule itself that these genes are responsible for making is the molecule that's going to repress their expression. So only when tryptophan is present will we get transcription blockage of these genes. So I got excited and I got ahead of myself. Let me back up here. <laughs> so a co-repressor, remember co-repressors are the molecules that bind to that repressor and allow the repressor to actually bind to the operator. And remember, whenever the operator is bound, transcription is going to get blocked. And once that molecule, that co-repressor drops below a certain level, then the cell is going to um, activate those genes again. So let's look at this model again, just kind of from the beginning. Our trip operon model has five genes. It has trip E, trip D, C, B, and A. So there's five different genes that ultimately will, once these genes are expressed, they function in the anabolism of the amino acid tryptophan. So remember that these genes are normally off or on. Ask yourself, do we normally have lots of tryptophan or, uh, I'm sorry, do we have normally have low tryptophan or high tryptophan? Well, um, as I mentioned earlier, most bacteria are going to exist in a media that doesn't have lots and lots of amino acids just laying around. So we're going to suppose and we're going to assume, and this is a, this is a safe assumption, that we don't have tryptophan just kind of laying around. So we need to express, express these genes. So as we can see, RNA polymerase is going to bind, recognize and bind to that promoter, and it's going to move downstream and start transcription of these five uh, of these five um, uh, five genes. Now, again, in these rare instances where we actually have to turn this gene off when we have high tryptophan, tryptophan itself is going to bind to the repressor protein and allosterically activate this protein such that it can now bind to the operator. Now when RNA polymerase recognizes this promoter, it's physically blocked from connecting to the DNA, and it can no longer move down the DNA to um, initiate transcription of these genes. And again, the bacteria doesn't want it. The bacteria does not need these genes expressed because it already has tryptophan in the uh, in the media. So this is a really, I think it's just such a cool system to think about. And again, there's an operon for all the amino acids. Think about the 20 different amino acids. There's a similar operon for all of the amino acids that a bacteria may or may not need at any given time. So even if it's not tryptophan, it might be histidine or leucine or methionine and, and so on. So all of these different amino acids have operon regulation similar, um, somewhat similar to tryptophan in that they are typically turned on, but they're able to be repressed if that bacteria finds itself in media that has lots and lots of all the amino acids. All right, so now let's look at a different system um, coming kind of from the other side of this, which is an inducible genetic system. So remember that inducible genetic systems or inducible genetic, op inducible operons are normally off. 
and they need to get activated. They need to get turned on somehow. And the classic example of an inducible genetic system is the LAC operon. There are three genes in the LAC operon that code for the catabolism, uh, um, the catabolism of lactose. So um, lactose is a disaccharide. You can see here it has it's a two ring carbohydrate. And once it gets inside the bacteria, there's an enzyme called beta galactosidase that will break lactose in two. And um, uh, this requires energy. And this will turn um, lactose into a molecule of glucose and a molecule of galactose. And then galactose can be further modified to ultimately turn it into glucose. So all that to say that lactose with a little bit of processing and a little bit of energy input can be turned into two molecules of glucose. <clears throat> So this system, this lac operon, is inducible because enzymes are only produced when the inducer is present. And I bet you know what the inducer is. So let's take a look at what this promote or this um, operon looks like. Notice um, <laughs> there's a there's a piece of this puzzle that I don't want you to see yet. So I put a big black <laughs> I put a big black box over this, and we'll talk about this here in just a little bit. But let's just look at the part that I do want you to think about for now. And that operon is of course our basic promoter operator gene sequence. We can see the promoter that where the RNA polymerase is going to bind. We have the operator, which is the landing site for the repressor. And we have our three um, uh, genes that ultimately code for the catabolism of lactose. Now, lactose is not normally around. Lactose is not a common carbohydrate for, again, just your typical bacteria, let's say E. coli, um, to have around. So we don't typically, a bacteria doesn't typically have the, the um, uh, a bacteria doesn't typically express these genes. So normally when we don't have lactose present, we're going to have RNA polymerase, um, potentially, I guess it could bind to the promoter, but even if it can bind to the promoter, it can't move past the operator because we have repressor bound. And it's physically, again, it's that clamp on the railroad tracks and it doesn't allow the train to move down the tracks. So we have expression suitably, um, what would this be, suitably um, turned off. Because again, we don't have any lactose, so why do we need these genes expressed? We don't. Now, let's say that the bacteria finds itself in a broth or in a situation in the environment where there's lots of lactose. And before we talk about how this works, I want to just very briefly talk about this, this term here, allolactose. Allo, for our purposes, allolactose and lactose are the same thing. It's just a slightly different, um, it has a very subtle chemical difference between it and lactose. But for, for, your, for our purposes, um, we're going to look at allolactose and lactose as the same molecule. So what happens when we have um, bacteria in the presence of lactose, lactose is actually going, lactose itself, again, remember, that's a very neat system where the molecule itself somehow controls expression of these genes. So the lactose or the allolactose is going to bind to that repressor and that changes the shape of this repressor, right? It's going to remember that a repressor, this repressor is a protein and proteins can change their shape quite easily. And if their, if their shape changes, that, mean, that means that they can't function in a way that they want to. So when allolactose or lactose binds to this repressor, the repressor can no longer bind to the operator and RNA polymerase should be able to move down the DNA and express these three genes. So again, normally off, but we can induce this system by the presence of lactose itself. If lactose is present, the repressor comes off the operator and RNA polymerase is free to transcribe um, these genes. So let's look at an example of a bacteria. Again, let's just say this is E. coli and we're going to grow E. coli in a medium that supplies the bacteria with both glucose and lactose. Now, before we talk about this growth curve, this is called a dioxic growth curve, um, let's talk about what bacteria want. Bacteria are like the worst 
the the most, I shouldn't say worst, but bacteria are like little kids. Like they'll always take the candy if they can. In other words, bacteria will always, always, always choose glucose over any other carbohydrate. And this is because if you think about it, um, ask yourself why that is actually. Why would, why do bacteria prefer glucose over any other carb like lactose or sucrose or maltose, all those other kind of exotic carbohydrates? Well, the answer uh, that I, I hope maybe you maybe you guessed is that glucose goes right into glycolysis. Remember that glucose is our simplest carb that can basically go straight into those central metabolic pathways and then go and get turned, either provide energy for the cell or get turned into all of those intermediates that can then make phospholipids or amino acids or DNA uh, nucleotides for DNA and RNA and and so on. So for bacteria, they love to keep it simple. Glucose can get imported right into the cell, right into the bacteria, and they can start using it right away to make all the stuff they need. Now, if they have another carb handy, they'll use it if they don't really have a choice. But remember that lactose has to get processed. It has to get broke. It has to get broken down and processed a little bit before it gets turned into glucose, and then it goes into glycolysis. So it's a little bit more complicated, and again, a waste of time and energy. All E. coli want to do is grow, 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 divide, grow, 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 divide, and so on every 20 minutes. Right? It's a race. It's a constant race. And as soon as they waste time. Um, doing something that they don't really need to do, their neighbors are going to outcompete them and they're going to die. So bacteria are going to preferentially utilize glucose. So let's look at our growth curve. Remember our growth curve with our leg phase and our log phase and so on, right? So we have bacteria and we added our glucose and our lactose here, and we're going to have that brief um, leg period where um, our bacteria are making enzymes needed uh, for growth. And then we're going to get this really nice growth period. Remember that growth, the, the slope of this line, the steeper it is means the faster these bacteria are growing. So here the bacteria really aren't growing at all. They're getting ready to grow. They're preparing enzymes and expressing all those genes that they need for growth. And as soon as those enzymes start to accumulate within the bacteria, they're going to see a really nice growth phase because they're using all that glucose that was given to them, right? So they're going to grow, grow, grow until they exhaust the glucose, right? They've used up their favorite carbohydrate source in glucose is exhausted. And so now we're not going to see any growth. Remember, the slope of this line basically goes to zero for a spell until we see this next growth spurt. So what's ha ask yourself, what's happening here? Well, you might guess, of course, that lactose now is being catabolized. And the growth that we see here is the cells or the bacteria, the E. coli, its ability to meta or catabolize and utilize lactose as a carbohydrate source. Notice it might be a little difficult for you to see this, but notice that the slope of this line isn't as steep as the slope of this line. In other words, the bacteria are growing faster here because this slope is steeper right? But this one's still respectable. It's good. And the bacteria are using lactose and they're growing on lactose just fine. And ultimately what happens is at some point in time, the lactose carbohydrate is going to get exhausted and the cells, the bacteria are going to enter a true stationary phase. So this is called a dioxic growth curve. We see this with lots of different carbs. The bacteria will always utilize glucose first, and we'll have this brief period where the bacteria basically <laughs> rearrange their genes and they turn on the genes that are needed for that next carb and turn off, uh, potentially turn off genes that they don't need anymore. So in this case, we're looking at lactose. <clears throat> so if you understand what I just said, you probably should be confused right now. <laughs> That's one of my favorite things to say in micro. If you get it, you're confused right now. <laughs> Because this shouldn't really make sense. Remember, let's go back to this dioxic growth curve here. Let's go back here. If lactose is added here, the system that I talked about before, if lactose is here, then the repressor can't bind, and these lactose genes should be expressed, and therefore lactose should be getting consumed early in this growth. We should see catabolism of lactose here because lactose is present. 
In other words, if lactose is present, the repressor, right, can't remember lactose binds to the repressor and doesn't allow um, blockage at the operator, and therefore all of these genes should be produced. But the dioxic growth curve shows us that it doesn't. So something else has to be going on here. And of course, it has to do with that region that I had a big black box over before. So before I talk about this, the other side of regulation of this lac operon, let's talk about the other regulatory compounds that are part of this story. <clears throat> so there's a couple more molecules and compounds that I want to introduce you to. First one is called cyclic AMP, C-A-M-P, or CAMP. And really, again, this gets a little bit complicated, but all I want you to remember about CAMP is that CAMP is inversely, so the level of this molecule in the cell is inversely proportional to the level of glucose. In other words, if glucose goes up, cyclic EMP goes down. If, cyclic, if glucose goes down, cyclic EMP goes up. So they're inversely proportional to one another. So seeing the levels of CAMP in a cell in a bacteria can give you an idea of the levels of glucose in that bacteria as well. Now, CAMP will bind to a, uh, a protein called CAP, catabolite activating protein. And CAP binds, of course, to the CAP site. And the only way that CAP can bind to this site is if it's bound to CAMP. So when CAMP binds to CAP, CAP is now able to bind to the CAP site. Well, so what? Like, what? why does that matter, right? Well, it matters a lot because if CAP is bound to this CAP site, it's going to help recruit RNA polymerase to this promoter region. In other words, even though the repressor isn't blocked, in this particular operon, the LAC operon, RNA polymerase isn't very efficiently recruited to this promoter. And the only way that RNA polymerase is attracted to this promoter efficiently is if the CAP protein is bound to the CAP site. In other words, if glucose is present, we're not going to have cyclic AMP. This is not going to have, this isn't going to um, be uh, present in any kind of amount within the cell and cap can't bind to the cap site. So this is going to lead to a very low level of expression of these genes, even if the operator isn't blocked. In other words, we have a two-part model. We have two ways of regulating this promoter. We have method number one, where we have physical blockage of the operator. And step number, or I should say step number one, is physical blockage of the operator. And step number two is activation of the campsite. And we really need both of those things to happen in order to get robust activation of these genes. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. Remember, if we have lots of glucose, bacteria want to use glucose. In other words, this is our ideal situation. If glucose is here, we don't need these genes, right? We don't need glucose because, I'm sorry, we don't need um, uh, to catabolize lactose because we have our favorite carb already in the soup, in our, in our broth, and E. coli therefore does not want to waste its time expressing these genes. So if glucose is high, then that means that no CAMP is going to be, re is going to be made. Remember that glucose and CAMP are inversely proportional to one another. If there's no CAMP, then CAP cannot bind to the CAP site. And we're only going to get, yeah, so RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter, but it's only weakly, um, kind of weakly attracted to this promoter. And therefore, we're going to get some expression of these genes, but it's going to be a low level. Like, we're not going to get a lot here because it's not an efficient process. Let's look at when we need it. Well, we need these genes to be present or be expressed when we have low amounts of glucose. When we have low glucose, CAMP is now going to be produced. When CAMP is produced, it can bind to CAP, and CAP can bind to the CAP site. When this occurs, and only when this occurs, will RNA polymerase be strongly, um, what, strongly um, uh, recruited to the promoter site, and now we're finally going to get high levels of transcription of these particular genes, because now we actually, or again, not us, E. coli actually needs these genes to be produced because it finally is ready to catabolize lactose. <clears throat>
So we have four different situations that it can occur. We can have um, both glucose, let's see where are we at. We can have both glucose and lactose present, or we can have both glucose, both carb sources abs absent. However, we can have glucose present, but no lactose. And then of course we can have our final situation where we have no glucose, but plenty of lactose. It's only in this situation, this last situation, where we want expression of these genes. In every other case, we really don't want these genes to be expressed. So let's look at the top two. Of course we don't want these genes expressed when we have no lactose, right? If we don't have lactose, lactose is absent in both of these situations, we don't want these genes to be expressed. And when lactose is absent, when lactose is absent, remember that that operator is going to physically block the RNA polymerase from moving down the DNA. So now let's look at when lactose is present here and here. So here lactose is present, so our operator is clear, but remember that glucose is present also. So again, we really don't want these genes to be expressed because we prefer to eat we, I'm just going to, I'm giving in. I identify as E. coli now. <laughs> we don't, we want to eat the glucose, right? We want this glucose. Um, we weigh, we would way rather eat the glucose because it's much more energetically favorable to us than the lactose. So again, we really don't want these genes to be expressed. So even though our operator isn't blocked, our RNA polymerase is only going to weakly activate these genes or weakly express these genes because it's not getting effectively recruited to this um, promoter. It's only in this situation where we want the, um, where we have no glucose, so we've either, we don't have any glucose where we've used it all up, but we have lots of lactose present where we want these genes to be expressed so that we can break down lactose and use it as an energy source. So in this, case, in this case, remember glucose is absent, so we have the cap able, the cap protein is able to bind to the cap site, and this um, greatly increases the ability of RNA polymerase to bind to this promoter. Once RNA polymerase is um, attracted to the promoter, um, it can move, the operator is clear, and it can, um, it can um, um, express these three genes. So a nice, um, a nice review for you would be to um, look at, make a table for yourself and think about what happens in each of these situations. So we have our two carbohydrates, they're either both present or both absent or one or the other. Ask yourself, is the camp signal high or low? Is the um, cap, this is the, the that, that's a typo, that should say CAP, the cap uh, protein, is it bound or unbound? Is the repressor um, bound to the operator? Uh, is the RNA polymerase recruited to the promoter site? And ultimately, do we get expression of those three genes? So what I would recommend you do is pause the video, try to work this out for yourself, and when you are ready, you can start the video again and see the answers. There you go. Here's the answers here. And